Tyler Elar, you want to get the Sunday school offer, please. <laughs> stand out about Psalm chapter 90? Absolutely. Uh, it's been our place in all generations. Absolutely. But you 
You went a little too far, brother. Your Bible should indicate something before that. Well, that was the first verse. I know it's the very first verse, brother. But there's something else I'm looking for. Okay, so it was a prayer of Moses, so we know that Moses wrote it. There's one other thing that we're missing in our study. It might be something as obvious or not so obvious as the page that separates the New Testament from the Old Testament. Let's see, the author is Moses. Yep, Moses wrote this song.
So when we look at Psalm chapter 90, what might be, let's just start with the key verses. What might be some key verses to describe this psalm? Or something that might stick out. Key verse, key verses. What verse or verses summarize Psalm 90 in a nutshell? So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Does anybody else see anything else that they want to point out as far as main verses or key verses? phrase do you think might sum up Psalm chapter 9? with ours 
and how we need to build our relationship with him and dwell in the beauty of his holiness, to dwell with God. How about some key words that might describe this passage? So we went from big, now we're going to small. I have one down that I don't recall seeing in this passage. I stole that one from a book, but frailty, because we're talking about the frailty of man. I don't think that's really in this passage. He might have taken that to, from a different translation, but it does talk about the frailty of man if we look at it through wider scope. But what about some key words in this passage itself? And I glory unto their children. How about one word, brother? Glory. So glory, the glory of God. Anything else? And purity. And purity? And purity. Beauty of the Lord. Oh, the beauty of the Lord. That's so beauty. I put down also dwelling place and destruction. Because we're looking at the destruction of man, but yet God as a dwelling place where man should be. So moving on, I always like to put down where when Pat verses are quoted in the New Testament, I did not see anything in Psalm 90 that was quoted in the New Testament by anyone. I did put this in the notes just to have it there. But according to Bible study guide, guide got let me get my tongue in order. According to BibleStudyGuide.org, they claim that Psalm 90 and verse 1 it was quoted in Matthew 22 and verse 44. We won't turn there. You can look at that on your own. I don't see it, but it is there nonetheless. When we look at the poetic style, and we're just covering this quickly, we won't look at the verses, but it appears that synthetic parallelism was used to describe in passages in this passage in verses 3 and 4, 9 and 10, and 12 through 17. What is synthetic parallelism? Parallelism is when the second member explains or adds something to the first. So you have one line, and then the second line adds something to that line. Antithetical parallel parallelism was used in verse 6. And that is the thought of the first line is emphasized by contrasting the thought in the second line. I'll go ahead and read just verse 6, just throw it out there. In the morning it flourishes and groweth up, and in the evening it is cut down and withered. So grow and wither, you have your comparison, your contrast there. We've already talked about the history of the psalm, who wrote it. We saw that is a psalm written by Moses, and it was probably written towards the end of his life with a reflection upon what happened in the wilderness. And if we were to discuss everything that happened in the wilderness, there is a lot to talk about. You have the statue that Moses saw when he came down from the mountain with the tablets, the golden calf. You have Korah rising up against him, rebelling against him. We have Miriam and Aaron rising up and get, coming against Moses. We have Miriam becoming leprous. We have the serpents that came out and bit him, that they had to look upon the serpent raise a serpent that was lifted up to be healed. I mean, there is just so much that happened in the wilderness. And when we look at this psalm, and Lord, that has been our dwelling place in all generations, you get a reflection, the idea of somebody reflecting backwards, perhaps over the lifetime, over an experience, of all the things that God has done for them. And when we look at this, the author comparing the immortality of God versus the, immor the mortality, immortality of God versus the mortality of man. How many of us in our younger days growing up think about how short life is? If we're in our teenage years, we're probably not giving it much thought. Maybe even in our 20s, we're not giving it much thought. We know we have to prepare maybe for retirement is coming down. But those thoughts are far from us. But if we were to set ourselves at a nature where we're going to do that, we're looking at ourselves approaching probably our golden years, or even in what they classify our golden years, or maybe our 60s, 50s, 70s, 80s, when we are reflecting back on 
all the things that God's done, we're reflecting back how many times we failed Him. But we're thinking about if only that I would have realized back then what I know now, I would have done so much more for God. Or if I only I knew now what I knew, knew then what I know now, I would have placed so much more trust in God. Or I would have done this different. We would have, I would have done that different. When we look at Psalm chapter 90, it is a passage of contemplation where the author realizes the immortality of God and compares it to his own mortal body. And when we look at that, it's easy to place it probably towards the end of Moses' life as an old man looking back, especially realizing that God has always been there from the get-go. He may not cross over into the promised land because he disobeyed God, but he still looks back that God was always there regardless. If we were to see Christ in this psalm, according to Keith L. Brooks, in Psalm chapter 90, the beauty of the Lord is the beauty of holiness, and it shall suffice. If in our lives his holiness is reflected by the Spirit, and we are transformed in the image of Christ from one stage of glory to another. The beauty of holiness shone with resplendent luster in the Lord Jesus Christ. And as he lives in us, it may be reflected in every disciple. If we look at this passage and we try to divide it up, Spurgeon claimed that there is a possibility that it may be divided into two sections. Verses 1 through 11 in verses 12 through 17. However, he continues to state that this psalm is in such perfect unity that there may be no real division at all. There will be people that argue that this psalm was written in two halves. We've already stated those halves. One maybe at one, or in his early years or at one point in time by the author, and one at a later time. Some may go so far as to claim that it was written by two authors, but everybody, for the most part, denounces that. But yet, when you look at this psalm, they all agree that there is such, this psalm is so perfect that there may be no real division at all. It may have been penned at one time. Now, I'm going to be skipping around the psalm a little bit. I'd like to go in order, but there are some things that eh, maybe we'll go in order anyway. If we get down to Psalm chapter 90 and verse 1, if someone would please go ahead and read Psalm 90 and verse 1. Lord, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Lord, there, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. I know I said in the past that Lord in all caps is reminiscent of the name Jehovah. But I don't know what it looks like in your Bible. Mine's all caps but also at the beginning of every um, chapter is in all caps in my Bible to begin with. So it may be a little bit deceiving. However, when you study out that name, Lord, first mentioned in verse 1, it is Adonai, which means my God. So when we start off this psalm, the author is recognizing who he's penning about. It's not your God, it's not his God, it's not her God, it's not the Egyptian God. But it's my God. It is personal. And when we look at verse 1, it is extremely personal. If we would uh, put phrase it this way, My God, thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. It is a personal relationship. He knows who his God is, and he's been, his God has been there for him the entire time. Regardless of what he's done in his lifetime, what he said, whether it was right, whether it was wrong, his actions, whether right or wrong, he knows that his God has been his dwelling place. And he recognizes him as his Lord, his God. No one else's, not even Jehovah, God, everything. But you know what? Let's make this personal. You are my God. This is different from Lord mentioned in verse 17. Because the in verse 17... Where it said, in the Lord, and let the beauty of the Lord, we have Lord there in all caps, our God. That Lord there is Jehovah, God everything. So he's talking about my God is personal in verse 1. So referring to he's everything you need, 
in the last verse. Now, if we get to verse 2, we have him going from our dwelling place, or my dwelling place, in all generations, to where has God been? And he goes, before the mountains were brought forth, for ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. So in verse 1, he goes, you are my God. But before you created me, before you created anything I saw that we see around us, you have always been God. There is no denying it. So the question then comes from, to us, where did God come from? Would someone please read Habakkuk chapter 3 and verse 3? Habakkuk 3.3, 3, please. God came from Tehran, from the mouth of Aaron and Sirach. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was filled with his name. So God came from Tehran. Let me just play a little passage of what S.M. Locker said. S.M. Lockridge, where did God come from?
is that the point after the debate? So which, which I want you to fill in the story of the rest of the uh, beginning of the universe. God, spiritual matter, impact on material matter. Okay, so two questions. All right. Good. All right, your question of where did God come from assumes that you're thinking of the wrong, uh, obviously it displays, that you're thinking of the wrong God. Because the God of the Bible is not affected by time, space, or matter. If he's, if he's affected by time, space, or matter, he's not God. Time, space, and matter is what we call a continuum. All of them have to come into existence at the same instant. Because if there were matter but no space, where would you put it? If there were matter and space but no time, when would you put it? You cannot have time, space, or matter independently. They have to come into existence simultaneously. The Bible answers that in ten words. In the beginning, or time, God created the heaven, there's space, and the earth, there's matter. So you have time, space, matter created, a trinity of trinities there, you know, time is past, present, future, space has length, width, height, matter has solid, liquid, gas, you have a trinity of trinities created instantaneously, and the God who created them has to be outside of them. If he's limited by time, he's not God. The God who created this computer is not in the computer, he's not running around in there changing the numbers on the screen, okay? The God who created this universe is outside of the universe. He's above it, beyond it, in it, through it. He's, he's unaffected by it. So for, and the, the concept that a, a spiritual uh, force cannot have any effect on a material body, well then I guess you'd have to explain to me things like emotions and love and hatred and envy and jealousy and, and rationality. I mean, if your brain is just a random collection of chemicals that form by chance over billions of years, how on earth can you trust your own reasoning processes and the thoughts that you, you think? Okay, so, uh, your, your, your question, where did God come from, is assuming a limited God, and that's your problem. The God that I worship is not limited by time, space, or matter. If I could fit the infinite God in my three-pound brain, he would not be worth worshiping, that's for certain. So that's the God that I worship. Thank you. So he's outside of time, space, or matter, according to Ken Hogan. And then we're going to wrap up by looking at uh, verse 12, which so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. To number our days, to realize that life is short and but a vapor. It is once here and gone already. But God teach us in our youth to number our days. God teach us where we're at to number our days. Because the Bible is clear. When it talks about a man who is about to build some barns, if he's going to do it, he needs to take into consideration the cost in advance. And it's comparing that to our salvation, that before we say yes, we need to make sure that we are willing to count the cost. But the same thing is true when it comes to us in our lifetimes. We need to realize that life is short, and what am I going to accomplish for God within this life? Because what will happen? Life is but a vapor. It's here once, it's gone. What is that? All you have to do is blink and bat your eyes and life is over. And what did you do with your life for God? And the Bible states that we need to realize our time is short and we need to use the wisdom we have and apply it. Number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge is knowing how you how to do something, but wisdom is knowing how to apply it. God, may I look at my life and realize that I have but a short time. And when we get down to it, no one, all, no one of us knows how long our life is going to be. There are people that come into life and they're here but a few years. There are people that their bodies may come into this life, but they, they're no longer there. Whatever the case may be. There are people that live to be 105. I saw a picture of a 105-year-old man who just shot a buck, I guess. There it was. But there are some people that don't even make it to 20 or 30. You know, none of us know how long our life is. The Bible states, as we read today, that the numbers of a year are four score. Four score, or three, no, three score and ten. How long is a score? Well, it's 20 years. So we're looking at seven, someone maybe being 70 years old. But what are we going to do with our life? And what are we doing with our life? You know, there are plenty of people that sit in church week in, week out, unaffected. 
We go home, we go about our daily routine. We go to our jobs, and we don't even think about the individual who's dying and going to hell. We don't make the effort to reach out to them and let them know their last day and tell them that Jesus loves you, that you can be with him forever, but the choice is yours. We come and maybe we sit in our pews and we don't even invite our neighbor to church. Maybe we don't even sit down and read our Bible every day like we should. Lord, teach us to number our days. Because if we really knew how much time we had or when we were going to die, maybe the way we approach life would be different. Maybe the way we would work for God would be different. But man, in ourselves, in our mortality, we don't think about these things until it's too late. God, teach us to number our days. When we look at the Word of God, time and time and time again, it compares our lives to something short. To grass, it's here one day and it wither away. It grows in the morning and it's gone in the evening. If we would even think about the mortality of man and what we can do in one stage of our life versus the other, we might change the way we approach life. I think it was the riddle of the Sphinx, and I can't remember the man involved in the mythology of it, but the riddle was what walks on four legs in the morning, two in the afternoon, and three in the evening. And the answer was a man, because as a baby, we crawl on all fours. As a grown up, we walk on two legs. But in the latter ends of our life, we walk with a third leg, a cane. Why is that? Because this mortal flesh, from the moment that we are born, is dying. And even in our teenage years, even if it does not feel that way, this body is still decomposing. It is dying. But we don't realize it until maybe we're going up there in years. We realize in our 30s, maybe that things are slowing down and our metabolism is slowing down and things aren't like they used to be. We can't run, we can't jump like we used to. Can't, maybe we can't flex like we used to. We get into our 50s and 60s and maybe we start getting out of breath quicker. We may not be able to do it so much. We may not be as strong as we once were. Why? Because this mortal flesh is dying, is going back to the earth. And then I remember a minister, she was talking about taking care of her mother and her later years, and her mom made the statement, you know, when I look in that mirror, I see an 80-year-old woman, but on the inside, I still feel like I'm 18. No. We feel like we're still young on the inside, but our flesh does not. May God, God, may we serve you while we're still young. Teach us to number our days that we may can do as much for the kingdom of God as possible. When we number our days, when we realize that life is short, or even in life in general, if we know we have a short time to do something, how much more do we pick up the pace, cut out the slack, and say, don't know, okay, i got to get this done, and now i just got to do it. We do that because we realize time is short. We have to work while we can. There's coming a time when it, the time frame or that window will fade away, and it will be no more. Life is but a vapor. It is grass. It is short-lived. It grows up in the morning and is withered by the hot sun and it dies. You know, our lives are short. God, teach us to number our days that we may work effectively for Him and that we would find Him to be our dwelling place like never before. Because if we realize that, maybe we would read the Bible more. Maybe we would study the Bible more. Maybe we would pray more. God, teach us to number our days and apply our hearts unto wisdom. Anybody have any thoughts, any comments, anything they want to add at this point in time? If not, we're going to close our own down and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and shall continue to do. Lord, we thank you that you're God who reigns on high and that there's none like you, Lord. Even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels at the four corners of the property above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. 
I pray that our hearts and our minds would be in one mindset and one accord. That we may worship you in sincerity and truth. That the Holy Ghost may move as he so desires. Anoint the song leaders and the musicians as they lead you upon the string instruments and the vocal cords. As they lead us in the song, you should have us to sing. Lord, I pray that you anoint the pastor's mouth and his mind as he brings forth your words for us, Lord. And may our hearts and our minds be plowed that they be good soil for your words to follow them. That we may be that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we would apply it to our hearts, that we would fall more in love with you than ever before, that our relationship with you would grow, and that we would be transformed in the very image of Jesus Christ like never before. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Thank you.